Hey everybody, thank you so much for being here and tuning in this weekend. My name is JJ Matai and I'm one of the worship pastors here at Jubilee Fellowship Church. I get the honor and the privilege of welcoming you to our online service here right now. If you're new here and you've never been here before or you're new, a couple of services watching, we would love to connect with you. We're not coming after you, we're not coming to your house. We just want to know you and connect with you to get you more connected to what's going on at our church. If you go to jfc.org new, we have a quick card you could fill out and you even get a gift in the mail sent to you just for doing that. What could be better than that? If you're part of this community at all in any way, we would love for you to be a part of our commenting during the service. It's a way for you to stay connected with other people watching online since you're not in the building, but certainly a part of the whole of the community. Finally, in every way and everything that's happening in our church, we just wanna draw everybody together in whatever way connects you. We have three easy ways that you could give to be a part of the bigger kingdom vision that our church has to share Jesus with people. So however you come here, however you want to be a part of it, we would love for you to connect with us, and I will see you at the end of the service. Good morning. How's everyone doing? Good. Uh, yesterday, JJ, my husband, who is the worship pastor, the Nuggets, right, were playing last night, which was, yeah, I told everyone, I was like, I'm going to bring a broom this morning, and didn't get to do that, but it's fine. But he told me yesterday, he was like, hey, listen, the Nuggets play at 6.30, so you need to wrap it up with your message. And I was like, huh, that's 10 plus years of marriage right there. Like, that's how you know you've been married a really long time. And this morning, I'm sure he feels the same. They, right there. There's the guy right there. <laughs> sure. Sure, JJ. Uh, so go abs, right? We're going to put our hope in the Avs today, that they will win. Jesus bless them. I had all four of my children, you know, childlike faith. We all prayed this morning. Right. It was a forced thing. You will pray for the Avs. No, I'm just joking. I'm totally kidding, okay? I'm kidding. Kind of. Um, so <laughs> we are in uh, a series on James. This is actually the last weekend. I hope you all have enjoyed it and have gotten a lot out of it. The first three weeks. It was James chapter one, James chapter two, chapter three, and I'm a middle child. So we're going to skip chapter four and go to chapter five this morning and just really focus on that. But just before we get into it, I just, um, the Lord just put this on my heart. If you, it's really easy to come on a Sunday or on a weekend to church and go, this is where I get my fill. And I'm just going to challenge you right now. This is not where you should be getting your fill with Jesus. Like this should be the overflow where we come together and we celebrate what the Lord has done Monday through Friday in our life and what he's doing inside of us, right? Like this is not the only place that you should be hearing from the Lord. This is not the only time that you should be praising his name. You should be in your Bible daily. You should be seeking out the word. You know, I was thinking every problem that we have in our life, the answer to it can be found in the Bible. If you need wisdom, it's in your Bible. If you struggle with anger, the, the promise for what you have, the freedom for what you want, it's in your Bible. You struggle with fear and anxiety, the freedom is found in your Bible. And this is where we should be first and foremost gathering what we need for our life. It should not be here. It should not come from my lips. It should come from your word and from his voice, right? That should be where we're seeking that. Um, I One time I dated someone. I know, shocker. I dated before JJ. Uh, and he told me I read the Bible one time and that's all I ever needed to do. It was JJ. Had to get you back. Just kidding. Um, but just even that fact, right? That it's like, well, I read it one time and a good, that's good enough. No, no, no. You should daily be reading it, no matter how many times you've read it. If you haven't read James, I encourage you, go read James today. It probably would take you under 20 minutes to read it, 30 if you have children. Uh, but you can do it today. I promise you, you can get through it and seek out the truth for yourself. Allow God to reveal something to you and something for you personally. So I just wanted to challenge you with that since we didn't, I mean, it's impossible. It would take probably a year if we literally broke verse by verse down of James. But 
to get into this, uh, James is, if it's not, when James wrote out the, his book, it wasn't in chapter one, chapter two, verse one, verse three, right? That's not how he wrote it. It was written like a letter and it's, it, it's, it's meant to be read as one idea, right? And so in chapter one, we really see, he recaps, he goes, all right, this is what I'm going to talk about through my whole letter, almost like it's a paper, an English paper. This is what I majored in. And, and you can see he was a very good writer he had his, it was very well organized and then chapter two through five he hits on the points he makes in chapter one and goes into great detail on that and today I'm going to spend time talking about verses seven through eight but I think it's really important that we understand the context of chapter five he's they're all connected all thoughts and I almost sometimes it makes it really easy for us when we have verses and when we have chapters because it it makes it easy to find what we're looking for right but some Sometimes it does us a disservice because we think they are not connected thoughts and we think they are not uh, meant to go together. So the first part of chapter five in James talks about money and the evilness of it, but also how like these people are wasting away their lives, right? You've, you've wasted your life on the comforts of the world and all of the sin that is in, included in that, on the indulgence of those things. And then he goes into the second part of it, talking about waiting upon the Lord and waiting upon his return and the harvest that we are to have in our lives. And then he finishes it talking about what that life really looks like and is lived out. And so I want us to understand, even though I'm focusing on one part in this, it really is all connected. It's saying, hey, don't live like this. This is not the way to live. This is what it should look like. And this is the details of how we do that. So I think that's really important. And I encourage you today to go back through and read that for yourself. But James 5, 7 through 8, where we're going to spend our time pretty much the entire day, says this, dear brothers and sisters, be patient as you wait for the Lord's return. And I don't think James is just saying, sit on your couch, do nothing, and wait until Jesus comes back, right? He's not saying that. He's saying, be patient in what and how you are living your life. Be patient to not turn away from the promises of God, but rather continue to wait upon the Lord. And I think it's crucial that we also understand this is not then saying, he's saying we should be excited for the Lord. We should be excited for his return. We should be expectant of him. If we're having to have patience for something, it's because it's something we want, right? We're going to Disney World in, in a month and I have um, a two and a half year old. His name is Shia. Uh, Shia, how do this is my this is the uh, how do I say this nicely? Shia is a possessive boyfriend of me. Like he thinks he owns me. <laughs> Truly, um, it's it, like he. <laughs> He won't let, he hates my hair up in a ponytail. I'm not sure why, like he has an opinion on that. And he's like, take it down, take it. Like eight tears, like throwing himself. Uh, you want to see someone throw a fit? Just watch my son when my hair is up in a ponytail. I one time joked with him and told him I cut it and he lost it. Like he lost it. I'm like, I'm just kidding. He was tucked into my shirt, Shy. It's fine, it's fine. Um, he told Milo, my second born, the other day, Shy was sitting on my lap and Milo came to talk to me and uh, Shy is said, do not talk to my mama. And I was like, well, so the issue with that is I'm also his mama. He goes, do not talk to her. Very, very. It's like a running joke at the, he comes with me to work here. And it's not a day uh, at Jubilee if someone doesn't hear Shia running down the hallways yelling, mama. Like, it's just, he has to, he had, they're shaking their heads because it's, this is very true. Like he's very, very obsessed with his mom and I secretly love it. He's my last. So I have, I'm like, oh, sorry, JJ. Aww. He doesn't want you. Oh, too bad. I'm so sorry. But like internally, I'm like, I love this. Be like this forever. 
right? Uh, so Shia, just, uh, he has been asking, I told him we were going to Disney World, and he has asked me every day. He had like zero patience, you know. This is where, this is how you know that this isn't something that comes naturally, because children come out with zero patience. I mean, literally day one. They want something, there's no wait time to that, right? This is something we have to learn. And Shia every day goes, oh, I think we're going to go to Disneyland today, or Disney World. And I go, no, we're not. He finally told me yesterday, he goes, I think just you and me should go to Disney World. <laughs> I was like, so that's awesome that happened. He goes, daddy and the kids are not coming. I go, they are coming, buddy. They are coming because your daddy's paying for it. So <laughs> he's coming. But just that whole idea, right, of children not understanding patience. It's like, are we there yet? You've ever been on a vacation with a kid? I remember my dad used to just turn up the radio louder and louder and louder. And kids don't understand that. And I just talked louder and louder and louder. Are we there yet? Right? But there's no patience. But this is something that we must learn in our spiritual walk with the Lord. It is, I, I, was, I was telling JJ, I was talking to him, I think, true, honestly, maybe it's one of the top three most things we should prioritize with our walk with the Lord, because a lot of time here on earth is spent waiting. It's spent waiting, and we must learn to be patient people. Then James says this, consider the farmers who patiently wait for the rains in the fall and in the spring. They eagerly look for the valuable harvest to ripen. We should be eagerly looking for what the Lord wants to do and for the harvest that we are to grab a hold of. And I think that it's so key to understand that James is saying you are not meant to just wait and sit on the sidelines and give up. We are meant to be doers of the word. We are meant to, the only way we get a harvest is by sowing a harvest, right? The only way you will reap is if you sow. And so James is saying, while you're waiting, you better be sowing. And then he finishes it, take courage for the coming of the Lord is near. The Amplified Version says this, so wait what? Okay, let me, let's start it again. So wait <laughs> patiently, brothers and sisters. He's talking about us, right? This is not to the world. He's talking about brothers and sisters in Christ. He's talking about us in this room this morning. Until the coming of the Lord, the farmer waits expectantly. We should have expectation for what the Lord wants to do, for the precious harvest of the land, being patient about it until it receives the early and late rains. You to be patient. It's the third time in two sentences that he's telling us this. Be patient, be patient, be patient. It must be something that we probably should pay attention to. Strengthen your hearts. Keep them energized and firmly committed to God. Because if you do not learn patience, you will slowly drift away from him. You will not hold fast to him. If you cannot learn to be patient, it is very hard to hold on to the promises of God when the winter is there and you are not seeing the crops rise up yet. I was listening to a message this week and the pastor was talking about the church in Revelation and he said the church and, um, that he goes, you, the, the, you are neither hot nor cold, right? But you are lukewarm. And that he would rather us be cold than lukewarm. And I was just, in the message he was talking and, and the revelation that he brought of, listen, like someone on fire, it's easy, right? Obviously God wants, I think all of us and desires all of us to be hot and on fire for him and sowing daily. But he Here's the thing about a cold person versus a lukewarm person is a cold person's heart can be thought out. God can convict a cold heart. God can transform a cold heart. There's not a lot that can be done with a lukewarm heart. So it's not that the enemy necessarily wants to snuff out your fire. He just wants to contain your fire. And if you can't learn the value of patience, you will find yourself not cold. You will find yourself lukewarm. 
You will find yourself in a place of going, ah, maybe a better word for lukewarm is apathetic. If we don't understand patience, we become apathetic about life. Whatever. I've been disappointed before. It doesn't really matter if I sow or if I don't. And the Lord says, no, 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 you should be patiently and expectantly waiting on the thing that I'm going to do in your life. If you sow, there's a harvest to be had. If you sow, there's something that will be reaped from it. And then he says, because the coming of the Lord is near. I put it in my notes, I think it's best said like this. We aren't called to just wait upon the Lord. We are called to wait patiently upon the harvest we have sown into and wait to see what he does with it. We are called to wait on the harvest, just like the farmers. So I want to go through today, and I want to break apart the, these two verses into three sections. And the first thing that James hits is this, be patient if you're taking notes. Right? Be patient. Like that over and over and over again in these two verses, he's telling us, be patient, brothers and sisters. Be patient. James 5, 7, the first part, dear brothers and sisters, be patient as you wait for the Lord's return. This is, uh, you, you know, you think you're um, a really patient person until you have children. And I thought I was the world's most, most patient person, realizing that just I was never tested in my patience till I had children. Or, okay, I'm just going to totally just humble myself before all of you. Last night, I took my children, Ezra, our oldest. He's like such a, hey, can we do this? Can we do this? Can we, like, he's just like so persistent that he finally wears me down on something. So he asked me yesterday like 10 times if we could go to Chick-fil-A for dinner. And he catches me when I'm talking to the other three, right? And he goes, hey, can we go to Chick-fil-A? And I'm like, yeah, sure. And then I'm like, wait, what? And I've already said yes. And all the other kids are like, Chick-fil-A! So we're like, I'm like, fine, fine. We'll go to Chick-fil-A. So we're going to Chick-fil-A. Do you want to know? JJ can attest to this. Do you want to know more than anything else in my life what just really, really tests my patience is sitting in drive through lines, especially at Chick-fil-A because they have the double and oh, if you are not a patient person, you know what I'm talking about. You trying to decide what lane you're going to go into, right? Like, oh, is it going to be the left or the right? And I can't even let JJ, he, don't, he like won't even pick anymore because like if he's in the car with me, I blame him if we're in the wrong lane. Guys, I'm not kidding too. Like I, like it, like it brings out the worst parts of me is sitting in the Chick-fil-A line and knowing I picked the wrong lane and watching like three cars. I'm like, that's not fair. That's not fair. Like I want to like tell them, I'm like talking to the person in front of me. I'm like, you should know what you want to order. It's Chick-fil-A. There's like four things on the lane. There's four things on this menu. There, how? Oh, like I'm not kidding. My children all know too. And last night I picked the wrong lane. And the Lord's like, remember that message you just spoke? I'm like, yes, Lord. Or, or this, this is the worst. Uh, airports are like the death trap. Uh, it brings the sin out in me. Like, I pray that none of you see me at an airport. I truly pray. I'm always like, I hope I don't run into anybody because I am the least patient person. And I think every person is an idiot. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Forgive me. But I genuinely think that when we're like all, I, they put us at the back of the plane and I am not paying extra, okay, for four children to sit up front. Like, I want to just, they're getting old enough now. Like, I want to leave them in the back and sit in the front. Like, that's where I'm like, see ya, because I don't like waiting in the lane. But the worst thing is when you're in the back and no one stands up and they all decide once it's their time to go that that's their time to get their bag. I'm like, no, it's not. That wasn't your time. It was five minutes ago. Just let me through. I'm a small person. JJ's laughing because... <laughs> Half the time, I just leave him. <laughs> because he is patient. And I'm like 10 people ahead of him. And he's like, what is wrong with you? I don't know. It's where I need you to pray for me, please. 
And I'm also annoyed at him because I'm like, get up here now. He's like, and he's also polite. He's like going to let the elderly go. He's going to let the women go. And I'm like, your wife should be put first, JJ. I matter. And this makes me so mad. So there you go. So there's my, I am teaching this. I picked this because I was like, Lord, I really need to learn about patience. Um, but if you're, are you with me, right? Do you know what I'm talking about? Thank you. JJ said, no, that's why God had me marry him. He teaches me patience on it, like reminds me, looks at me like I'm insane. And sometimes I feel that way. But listen, this is something that we do have to practice. Okay. And, and yes, it's in those times, it's funny. I don't feel like it's funny when I'm waiting in the line, but there is something in it. But even last night I'm sitting there and I spent 45 minutes talking on being patient and I can't even wait an extra minute for the guy in front of me to figure out what he wants to order. Right. And just like, even in that, just the conviction of, oh, dang it. I think I have this down and the Lord very quickly humbles me and knowing that that's not true. But if we can take that to a spiritual, that's just in practical terms. But I think there are so many people who the Lord has given them something, an instruction on something, a promise on something, a relationship. You, what is it for you? And we're willing to give it four minutes before we abandon the thing. Right? It's, it's like, oh, I don't want to wait anymore. God, you're not doing the work, so I'm probably going to just leave. I'm just going to abandon the field you've given me here, and maybe I'm going to go try something else there. Charles Spurgeon, who's just one of my favorite theologians, he says this he ha- in a message, as James instructs us, we are to wait upon God and not lose heart. We're not to lose heart in the middle of the waiting. We are supposed to expectantly wait and have belief for what God wants to do. A man to whom it is given to wait for a reward keeps up his courage. And when he has to wait, he says, it is no more than I expected. In fact, I think we should honestly begin to shift our mindset into an understanding of we are most likely going to have to wait on the thing that God has promised us. That when we begin a season and when we begin in what God has for us, that we have the understanding, God, most likely you will have me wait in this. And it takes courage, right? Because in the middle of it, when you are waiting on a promise and everyone around you is like, are you sure? Did you really hear from God in this? I don't see any fruit in your life right now. Let's take a relationship. You feel called that there's supposed to be reconciliation with someone and everyone else around you is counseling you like, ah, is that really? And it takes a courageous person to go, I'm going to stand on the thing that the Lord has called me to. I think about Noah with this. Here's a man who was given an instruction from the Lord to build a giant boat because a rain is going to come and it's going to flood the whole earth. Like really, we hear that. And because we grow up with that story at such a young age, it just becomes like this cute little story. But really think about what God is asking of Noah. He risks his reputation in this because it hasn't rained on the earth. He's telling people, repent of your sins because the rains are coming. And they're like, what the heck is rain? And, and, And here's the thing. God doesn't build the boat with Noah in a day. God takes a long time for this to happen. And I think part of it, right, is to give people a chance to repent in the story. I also think part of it is going, Noah, how long are you going to wait on me? Do you have courage to, to wait when everyone else mocks you? Do you have courage to wait when no one else is with you? Do you care more about what I think than what others think? Waiting is courageous, church. It takes brave people to wait upon the Lord. 
I never reckoned that I was to slay my enemy at the first blow. Think of David. He doesn't take one stone with him, does he? Because he has an understanding, hey, this may not take just one time or one giant before the battle has been won. And that should be us. We should be like David and we should be like Noah in recognition. You know what? Maybe it won't happen on the first try. Maybe it's not supposed to happen on the first try. Maybe God, it takes three times or 10 times or 40 times. But until you tell me to move on, I will firmly plant my place in the field you have called me to. I will not abandon what you have for me. I will obediently and courageously wait on you. I never imagined that I was to capture the city as soon ever I had dug the first trench. Think of the battle of Jericho. It was not the first day that they found victory. And think of the, the humility, the courage that it took. I'm sure the, the city is laughing at them, right? Mocking them. You're just marching around our walls. Look at you. And they have to get up the next day and the next day and the next day and the next day and to continue on until God does what he says he's going to do. We are to work till we see the harvest. I reckoned upon waiting and now that it has come, I find that God gives me the grace to fight on and wrestle on. There is grace for you in your season of waiting. But you must wrestle and you must fight on. Till the victory shall come. And then listen to this. And patience saves a man from a great deal of haste and folly. We rarely see the results of what we are looking for on the first shot. Sometimes it takes praying without ceasing to see the results you want to know what happens when you don't wait on the Lord? So it's like this, right? Like here's my field right here. And the Lord has called me to this thing. And in the winter season, there is not going to be a crop that comes up. It isn't until the spring that we begin to see that. And we don't know how long that will take in a spiritual way. But if the Lord has called us to this and we have sown into this and we go, I don't see it. So I'm going to leave and abandon my field and come over here to this field and begin to sow here. Do you know what happens? Abraham is a great example of it because he wasn't willing to wait upon the Lord and the promise. And he created for himself Ishmael. He did not hold on to the promise. He did not have the courage. Hear what I'm saying? He did not have the courage to wait for the Lord for what he wanted to do. Instead, he was fearful. And he goes, I'll take it into my own hands. That's what we do. That's the opposite of waiting on the Lord is the control. We then decide to control it. And we abandon a good field and the promises of God. And you know what? How oh, I, someone else will come and find your field and they get to then reap your harvest. And then you're stuck over here doing something you weren't called to do, living a way God didn't ask you to live. And you're not in the place and then you're frustrated and you then blame God. Because you're in a place that you're not seeing a harvest because you aren't in the place God called you to be. And, and, and I think we do this all the time as, in our Christian walk. Well, I don't see the fruit, so I'm going to run and do something else. And I get it. It's easy in this day and age, isn't it? Everything's so instantaneous for us. I was annoyed yesterday that Amazon couldn't deliver my package yesterday. Like two days is too long for us to wait now. I'm annoyed that I have to wait five minutes at Chick-fil-A. I'm 
I'm frustrated that the King Supers is out of the organic spinach that I like. And I don't want to wait. And I think part of this too is we don't understand because we don't, we don't make most of what we have. There's no delayed gratification for us. We don't get to learn that. So we're frustrated when, we, when the Lord wants to teach us patience. Because nothing else in our life asks us to be patient anymore. Like, really, can you think? Uh, there's so few things that I have to be patient for in life. Anything I want to know, I can look up on my phone. Anything I want to eat can be delivered to my house within an hour. Anything I want to do, I can jump on a plane and go do. Anything I want to eat is in stock in any grocery store. And I don't have to understand the, the work, the patience to get those things. But the Lord is not into just taking you as you are and leaving you there. He wants to develop you. He wants to turn you into something that looks more like who he is. And he is patient. Patience produces character. Some versions of your Bible will probably say endurance. But in a specific version, it says patience produces character. I want to be a person of character. And the only way I get that is by being patient. And that character produces hope and hope will never disappoint. And we think it's the opposite. God, give us hope first and then we'll be patient. And he says, give me your patience and I'll give you my hope. Develop yourself and you'll find your own hope. James 5.16 says this, the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. But we must be willing to wait and be patient on what he's doing to not abandon that prayer, to not leave that thing, to continually seek him in that thing. If he hasn't called you to leave it, you know, sometimes I think we make this mistake that his silence is permission to abandon our field. His silence is a test in your patience to stay in your field, to wait on him. If you haven't seen the harvest, he hasn't released you from it. Which leads me then to my second point. Eagerly look for the harvest. We're going to talk about farming this morning. Um, my ultimate dream in life is to own a farm. I'm dead serious. Like this is my, I asked JJ probably weekly if we can buy a farm. I want to own animals. I'm like, we can have cows and sheep and chickens and horses. And JJ's answer to me is you don't know how to take care of any of those things. Thank you. Thank you. I told him, I was like, that's what YouTube is for. His response was, you hate getting up early. And my response back was, you don't. <laughs> See? So it works. I can YouTube and tell him what to do, and he can do it. But he can take care of the animals, and I want, to I, want, I want a giant garden. Like, I, I love it. This is truly, this is where I find so much joy and so much peace in my life. And really, it is a great learning of patience for me. But I, I, I've taught, like, I've, our children do it with me now. It's just, like, it brings me great joy in my life. And we should find things that bring us great joy in our lives, right? JJ? So pray for him that God would lead him down the right path. <laughs> but James 5, 7 tells us this. Consider the farmers who patiently wait for the rains in the fall and in the spring. They eagerly look for the valuable harvest to ripen. 
If there are details like talking about the rains in the Bible, it's not on accident. And sometimes I think because it was written a long time ago, we very quickly skip over that. We're like, I don't know what that means and just keep reading. But there's something that James is trying to tell us in talking about these two rains that we don't necessarily have context for because we have water at our house readily available to us, right? I do not have to look for if it's going to rain to make sure my crops are watered. Actually, I did. I pulled up pictures just for proof that I, I really, guys, I like to garden a lot. This was like daily at our house. You see, I was growing corn. Didn't know how, figured it out, tasted terrible. So <laughs> I gave it to my kids. They seemed to like it. I was like, does that taste weird? And they were like, no, it's good. I was like, okay. <laughs> Probably should have made popcorn with it or something like that. Okay, the next one. So this is my little daughter. The other boxes. I just had started to grow. We had to plant those things later, but that's my spinach and my peas and my lettuce growing. And Ivy would love to go out with me daily and look at all that had grown. And then the next picture, the, see, look, I, this was like, I had so many carrots. I didn't even know what to do with. Like it was, it was the best. And I really love carrots. So do my children. And then the next one, See, I had to clean. This was this is where I got hung up is the cleaning of the produce. Um, it took me hours. I'm probably a, I was like very paranoid about bugs being in the stuff. So it would, I like scrubbed everything, and then you have to like store it really right. And then it really made me realize what the heck are they putting in our food at the grocery store? That doesn't make it wilt like it does in the in, in my garden. That's another day, another time. And then look at here's my video to show my garden. This was for Instagram, but there's Ivy picking tomatoes, and there's Ezra, but this is, and now I need, like, um, I need acres. I've proved myself worthy of a farm. <laughs> but I could water that. JJ could water that. Um, <laughs> daily with the hose, right? It didn't take a lot of effort. We weren't looking to the rain clouds in hopes that it would rain. It just was readily available to us. But in Bible times, there were two rains that were required for there to produce a harvest of that year. And the farmers had to wait on both of them. Both were equally important. And the first one was an early rain that would happen in late October or early November. And here's the thing. Without this rain, nothing would germinate. And this rain, the, the purpose of what it did is it broke up the soil. It softened the soil. So that the seed could take root and over winter could germinate and by spring something could begin to grow. And I think a lot of times I'm like, okay, Lord, like why is that? Why, why is that in the Bible? Like what, what does that serve in a spiritual sense to us? You know what? I think a lot of times we misinterpret the first rain for the second rain. And so if we don't see a harvest after that first early rain, we go, well, this is a bad crop and something didn't go right. So let me leave this thing. Let me start over. I think we see this is in churches all the time that the Lord begins to break up the ground. He begins to soften hearts. He begins to do a work inside of that church. And right out of that season, it becomes a dry cold winter. And we immediately, our, our expectation is, oh, something bad happened. Something went wrong. So what we do is we don't wait on the Lord. We leave the thing to try to go figure it out over here and do it in a different way. He's like, no, no, you're not waiting patiently on me. And the winter is critical too in growing the crop and growing and having a harvest. I've never met a mature Christian who hasn't gone through a winter season. I've never met a, a person who has a deep and intimate relationship with Jesus who has not gone through a hard time. Who has not had to learn to wait on him. I was talking to somebody last night who is a dear friend of mine who has gone through, they came to service last night and they, this last year has been just worst year in their entire lives. Just hard. 
every day was hard. And the person was telling me, you know, everyone thinks like that patiently waiting on the Lord is just like, it's easy. And he said, most times that patiently waiting on the Lord is the hardest season you will ever face. Which is why it takes courage to stay in that place and to not abandon that thing and to not leave that thing. Because if you do, you will also not see the harvest of what he has for you. And I think what we do is we go, oh, I'm so disappointed. I didn't see the harvest because you're only at the first rain. That's not where the harvest comes. Now you have work to be done before the harvest can happen. But then again, another rain had to come for the farmers in April and May. And pay attention to this, without which the grain would not mature. That first rain germinates the seed. That second rain matures it. And we need both. The farmer needs patience to wait until nature does her work both times. And the Christian needs patience to wait until Christ does his work on our harvest. So I put this down in my notes. How does the farmer wait? If James is telling us, and the Bible brings up farmers a lot. There are a lot of parables of farming. I mean, one, mainly because that was a very big job during that time. But also, I think there's something to be learned about how a farmer lives his or her life. And so how does the farmer wait? He waits with a reasonable hope and expectation of reward. He knows that at the end of the season, no matter how long the winter, there will be a reward for his sowing. He waits a long time. Part of this walk with the Lord is waiting. It is inevitable. You cannot avoid it. He waits working all the while. He waits depending on things out of his own power with his eyes on the heavens. We cannot look to our right or to our left. We are called to keep our eyes on the heavens, to wait for his reign, to look for his reign, to cry out for his reign. He waits despite changing circumstances and many uncertainties. He waits encouraged by the value of the harvest. He waits, here's, here's this one. He waits because he has no other options. When you give your life to Jesus, you have now submitted to him. And there's nowhere else for you to go but to him. Nothing now will satisfy like him. Nothing will bring contentment to you but him. And the farmer understands, I've sold all that I am to this. I've given all that I am to this. So all I can do is wait because I have no other option. This is it. This is it. This is all I have. He waits because it does no good to give up. It does no good for you to give up on your field. I mean, you've already sown into it. Don't give up on it. He waits aware of how seasons work. That there's a fall and a winter and a spring and a summer. And he does it over and over and over again. He waits because as time goes on, it becomes more important and not less important to do so. You're one day closer today than you were yesterday to your harvest. So if you didn't give up yesterday, why give up today? And tomorrow you'll be one day closer. And we should be eagerly expecting, God, I'm closer. I'm closer to your return. I'm closer to the harvest. I'm closer to the thing that you've promised me than I was yesterday. So with joy in my heart, I will eagerly look to the heavens for what you want to do and how you want to do it. Galatians 6, 9 says this, 
Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will what? Reap a harvest. And here's the most important word in that entire thing, if. If, if we do not give up. Yes, God will give you a harvest. Absolutely. It is his promise to you. You cannot give up. You will only receive your harvest if you do not give up. Don't grow weary in doing the work of the Lord. Don't grow weary in in following after the promises of him. Because at the proper time, you will reap a harvest. And it will be better than anything you could have imagined, anything you could have fathomed. And my last point is this. Take courage. The coming of the Lord is near. You too must be what? Patient. You too must be patient, James tells us. Take courage for the coming of the Lord is near. The New King James Version says it like this. You also be patient. Establish your hearts. I love that. Establish your hearts. May you be rooted in your faith. May you mature yourself for the coming of the Lord is at hand. I put in my notes, the soon return of Jesus requires us having established hearts, hearts that are fully submitted to Jesus and his will in all things. Not my will, but his will. Not my timeline, but his timeline. Not my desires, but only his desires. He does not work on the same timeline that we do, church. You want to know what the greatest, the the most fully submitted people are? Are people that go, even if I don't reap this harvest, but future generations will reap this harvest, I will continue to sow into this harvest. Because I understand that there is an eternal harvest for me to reap. I think about this with my children. I want to sow into the land. I want to sow into the things of the Lord because I want them to inherit my harvest. I want them to reap what I have sown. I want them to run further and faster than I ever did in my lifetime. But I only make that possible for them if I continue to sow on a daily basis. And sometimes I have to submit, an established heart goes, I submit to you, Lord, that I may never see this in my lifetime, but it doesn't mean there won't be a harvest to be reaped one day. We see this all throughout the Bible. Men and women who understood, I am sowing for a future generation. The Israelites understood maybe the freedom from bondage won't happen in my lifetime, but it will happen one day and I will continue to cry out and I will continue to pray to you and I will continue to have hope that you will free my people, that you will free my children, that the bondage that holds me will not hold my children, will not hold future generations. Your sowing does not just impact you. Your sowing impacts the future kingdom. So if you don't do it for you, do it for your children. Do it for my children. Do it for an entire generation that is over there right now learning the things of Jesus. My son prays before service and he goes, I pray that every person would come to know the Messiah, the one true king. You know why he prays like that? Because I have sown into that. Because I have modeled that. Because JJ has modeled that. The passionate prayers of people who are willing to have hope in all things. Charles Spurgeon says this, when God shall give you a rich return for all you have done for him, you will blush 
You will blush to think you ever doubted. You think you're sowing hard? Just wait to see the reaping he has for you. It is so much greater than what you ever sowed. He gives back tenfold to us. You will be ashamed to think you ever grew weary in his service. You shall have your reward, not tomorrow, so wait. Not the next day, perhaps, so be patient. You may be full of doubts one day, your joy sink low. It may be rough, windy weather with you in your spirit. You may even doubt whether you are the Lord's, but if you have rested in the name of Jesus, if by the grace of God you are what you are, if he is all your salvation, not some of your salvation, not your salvation when life looks good, not your salvation when you are reaping and the harvest is plentiful, no, no, all of your salvation. When he becomes the most prized possess, the most prized thing that you have inside of you, when he becomes the only thing that matters, when it becomes what he wants over what you want, when it becomes his desires over your desires, that is what all of your salvation looks like. A heart fully submitted to him. And all your desire have patience. Have patience for the reward will surely come in God's good time. There is a reward for us who have patience and wait on him. And that second part, right? Have patience, take courage for the coming of the Lord is near. James in this moment, and I'm, I'm wrapping it up here so we can get out of here to watch the ass. Uh, there, is a, there is three different words in Greek to, de to describe the second coming of Jesus. I don't speak Greek. I know that's probably a shock to you. So please forgive my pronunciation if you do. But there are three ways that we see the second coming of the Lord described. And there's different meanings behind each one of them in Greek when this was written. And so the first and most common is parousia. It represents someone's presence of arrival. Also used as the invasion of a country from a king. So we see this all throughout the New Testament talking about parousia in context to the second coming of Jesus. And so when it is used in context of Jesus, it means that his second coming is the final invasion of earth by heaven and the coming of the king to receive the final submission and adoration of his subjects. The Matthew tells us, I'm paraphrasing this a little bit, but the kingdom of heaven is violent and the violent take it by force. We are not meant to sit on the sidelines and hang out and chill and eat popcorn and just wait for the second coming of the Lord. You have work to be done. And the violent take it by force. What does that mean? It means we are meant to fight our enemy. It means we are meant to take back ground that he has taken. You have authority, you have purpose, you have calling. And I know for me personally, I want to rob the enemy as much as possible of the land he wants to take. For my own life, for my children's lives, for my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren that I don't know, that I don't see their faces, but I know one day, I want our earth to look a little more like heaven than it does today. The second word is epiphania. And when it comes to Jesus, this word means his second coming is God appearing to his people, both those who are waiting for him and those who are disregarding him. Because it says one day we will all bow our knee before him. But you have an opportunity right now to do the work. This is the only time. Once we're in heaven, this is the time to sow church. There are things we can only do right now here on earth. There are sacrifices that we can only have now. There are tears we can only cry now. Like hear what I'm saying, right? Because there it's perfect, but here it's costly. 
And then the third thing is this, apocalypsis. It means an unveiling or laying bare. In regards to Jesus, it means that his second coming is the laying bare of his power and glory of God come upon men. There will be no need for a son because he will be it. He shines so bright, not just in the spiritual sense, but also in a physical sense that the high priest couldn't even stand before his glory lest they be killed. So when we put all three of these together, the complete picture James is telling us of the second coming of Jesus is the arrival of the king. It is God appearing to his people and mounting his eternal throne. And finally, it is God directing on the world the full blaze of his heavenly glory. What are you waiting for? That's what we're waiting for. That's what we're sowing into. I want to stand before him, not ashamed, but so proud of the thing I've sown into here on earth. I want to stand before Jesus and say, I didn't waste my life on the money and on the riches and on the adult indulgences of my flesh, but I sowed into the harvest of the kingdom of God. I forsaked all else to follow you. And I waited patiently for you, Jesus. I knew this day would come. I knew you would come back for me. I knew you would fulfill your promises. And here I stand before you, so proud to be before you. And I want to hear the word, sorry. Well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. Don't you want that too? There's nothing better that this life can offer. There's no greater treasure than hearing the words because his words are life and his words are power and there will be something so incredible that happens when he says, well done, good and faithful servant. It is the greatest gift you will ever receive in all of eternity. So I close with this. He's not yet here, so there's still work to be done. And James finishes his letter to us, telling us and instructing the believers of these things. You want to sow into your field? You want to sow into your promises? Here's the things you sow into. You pray. You want to see a harvest? You pray. And I don't just mean really quick before dinner, dear Jesus, thank you for this food blessing in your name, amen. No, I mean you're down on your knees and fully submitting to him and fully going after him. God, I need you. God, I'm desperate for you. God, would you come and make your way clear to me? That we don't get up off of our knees until we see him move. That we don't abandon the prayer until it's been answered. He tells us then we're to sing praises. And this one convicts me. I was thinking I can scream so loud, lose my voice for the nuggets and for the abs during a playoff season. And it's so exciting in our house and my children are jumping up and down. And then I think in the back of my head, when was the last time I experienced this for you? When was the last time I gave you my all in that way? When was the last time I lost my voice singing out your praises? I want to sow into my kingdom. I need to sing to you that you are good and you are faithful and you deserve every single one of my praises before anything else in my life. We're to lay hands on people. We're to anoint with oil in the name of the Lord. Here's one, we're to repent. You want to see a harvest? You got to repent for the way you've gone wayward. God, I'm sorry. God, I'm sorry for my pride. God, I'm sorry that I didn't wait long enough in the field that you had for me. 
God, I'm sorry for doubting your word. God, I'm sorry that I took control. God, I'm sorry that I wasn't brave. God, I'm sorry that I gave it all up for something so trivial. God, I'm sorry that I indulged my flesh instead of running after you. God, I am sorry. God, I want to do it your way. God, I want to sow into this. And anytime we begin to repent like that, you're sowing. You're sowing. Confessing your sins. Here's one. Confessing your sins to one another. I think sometimes we like get the repentance part of going to the Lord and going, I'm sorry. And then the second it has to do with somebody else because a lot of times our sin doesn't just impact us, right? The thing we've done is we've wronged somebody else. But the Bible actually tells us we are to go to that person and repent to that person. And I felt for this weekend, I think God wants to bring reconciliation to relationships. I think God wants to sow. That's how, that's the sowing of your field. But you got to go to that person with humility in your heart, not thinking of what they did to you and how they wronged you. No, uh, that's not repentance, church. Going, well, I'll only say sorry if you say sorry back. You missed the point. But I know this is on people's hearts this morning. Maybe it's a marriage. Maybe you came this morning and you are at ends. I know I'm going a little long, but I really feel the Lord in this right now. You are at just your breaking point with your spouse. You have fought and you have fought. You have allowed offense into your heart. You look at that person and you don't even see the person you married. Today is a day to sow into that field. To reconcile. To open your eyes to the things that you've done. I know it's for someone right now. I did not do this last night. But I think there's some broken marriages in this room. And I think you're sitting here like, that message was so great. I want to sow. I want to sow. And you're so excited for that. And I think the Lord's gently, sweetly, the conviction of, you're not sowing into the person you love the most. We're so willing to do this for strangers. We're so willing to do this for the kingdom. And you know what? This is the, the marriage is the, the representation of the relationship we should have with him. And so in the name of Jesus, may that fall off your marriage right now. May reconciliation be possible. All things are possible with him. Maybe you're in the middle of a filing right now. God can do anything. God can do anything. I have seen it. I have seen it in the lives of friends of mine. I have seen the miraculous happen. God can do anything. God can bring your prodigal son and your prodigal daughter back home. And maybe you're sitting here this morning on either side. Maybe you're the prodigal son or the prodigal daughter and you think you're so right in why you've left and why you've cut that relationship. And maybe you are. Listen, I'm not here to judge and I'm not here. You, you gotta do what's right between you and the Holy Spirit, right? And maybe it's the opposite. Maybe you're a mother or you're a father and there's a brokenness in that relationship and you feel so right and so justified in why you are doing what you're doing. But ultimately, you know what God's hope is for it? Reconciliation, forgiveness, healing. God can do anything. And saying, hey, I'm sorry, and like, I want to make this better, doesn't mean you need to go back to what it was. No, God wants to make it better than what it was. God wants to heal the brokenness. And then the final thing James tells us is this, to bring back sinners. When was the last time I shared the gospel message? I feel such a deep conviction in this. Like I'm so willing to get up on stage and teach to all of you because this to me is easy because you all believe what I believe. 
But put me one-on-one with someone who doesn't know the truth, who doesn't experience that, and it is so much harder. But that's God's hope for us. That's sowing. That's, that's planting. And so real quick, I do want to do communion. It's the last weekend. And I asked, um, instead of doing it during worship, if we could all do it together. Because this is sowing into the kingdom. This is, the, this is why we sow into the kingdom. This is why we get to do what we do. Because Jesus, if you would open it and grab that cracker, this is the representation of his body that was broken for you. And we only can have relationship and do what we do because of who he is and not because of what we do or who we are. So if you would just grab this with me. God, I thank you for your body that was broken. And I thank you for the most precious gift that you could have given us. Life with you. May we take it with thinking of that, Jesus. And then if you would open the grape juice. Jesus tells us, right, this is a representation of his blood that was shed for us. And I know a lot of churches nowadays shy away from that terminology. But church, this is what this represents. In a physical way, he shed his blood for you. Physically, he died for you and spilled his blood. So yes, I will say that and I will say that proudly. With all that I am, I thank you, Jesus, that you shed your blood for me, lest us never forget what you have done. Thank you, Jesus. May we drink this today in thanksgiving that he is the only reason we have relationship with our Father. Thank you, Lord. You just bow your heads and close your eyes, Jesus. I just thank you, God, for your work. I thank you for the ministry today. I'm going to do this a little different than I did last night. Uh, You don't even have to raise your hand. Um, You can if you're comfortable. But I just felt like I'm supposed to pray over marriages, over broken families. I just think there's something in that this morning. So if you're willing, if you just raise your hand in that. And it's okay if not. Yeah, I see you all over this room. And there's okay. This is where we come to allow Jesus to heal us. So right now, I pray in the name of Jesus, healing for broken marriages. I pray the breakthrough for broken marriages. God, I pray that they would have eyes to see each other the way you see them, Jesus. Not in their brokenness and not in their sin, but Lord, the way you designed for us to be made. I just pray over families that are broken and struggling right now that you would do the miraculous, that all things, God, are possible through you, Jesus. Nothing is too great and nothing is too big for you. And we thank you for that. And we give you today. I pray breakthrough in these families. I pray healing in these families. God, I pray testimonies come out of this. God, that the seed that has been sown, that the harvest will be great and bountiful, Lord Jesus. In your name, amen. Hey, it's me again. Thank you so much for watching our service and being a part of this. I personally hope, and all of us from Jubilee Fellowship Church, hope that God connected in your life and met you right where you are this weekend in this service. Like I said at the beginning, just because you're watching online does not mean that you're not part of the whole of the community of what our church is doing. And we are so grateful that you're a part of this. So before you go, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and we hope to see you next weekend. Have an awesome week.